reading of the scripture. Sometime afterward, David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. David took Methgog of Ahmad out of the hand of the Philistines. He also defeated the Moabites and making them lie down on the ground, measured them off with a cord. He measured two lengths of cord for those who were to be put to death and one for those who were to be spared. And the Moabites became servants to David and brought tribute. Now, Pastor Ken. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> May be seated. And, and today we've got to figure out what is that scripture about? What's going on here? So, so the ark is now in Jerusalem, and we think things should be settled down, but there's still some things that have to happen, and David is working now to consolidate his kingdom. Now, this chapter describes the national life of Israel during the reign of David, and it's the, this is one reason why he's generally regarded as the greatest king Israel ever had, because of what happens basically in this chapter. Part of God's covenant with David included the promise that the Israelites' enemies would be brought under control and no longer oppress them. And we see that in this verse, and it's, oh, I'm seeing writing on here. It's, it's, it's Dustin trying to fix things. And the basic thing is the last line there, I will give you rest from all your enemies. This was God's promise to David. He would give him rest. So God is fulfilling that promise by helping David wipe out the enemies. All right? So David attacked uh oh, I need a clicker on again. He had to restart the computer, so it. Thank you. So David attacked the Philistines and subdued them, and David took the Methag Amma city, which is it's a it's the famous Philistine city of Gath. And uh, so before. David became king, the Philistines were taking territory from God's people. They were constantly attacking and taking areas. Under David's leadership, God's people began to take the territory from the enemy. So three questions out of this chapter that we might ask God about. And Lawrence, it's okay to ask God, right? Is that okay? All right, good. How could God condone this constantly attacking of David to the enemies? Because that's what this chapter is about. He's constantly attacking everybody else. How can God condone that? Well, well he took away his, his right to build the temple. Yeah, he took away David's right to build the temple for this reason. And uh, that's one of my questions here. Yeah. So all we can do is trust that God has a plan and a purpose bigger than we can understand. The second question, is this why David couldn't build a temple? And isn't it partially God's fault that David couldn't build the temple? Because Dave, or God's telling God to wipe these people out? I mean, so Dave, God ought to take part of the... And, and this is what we kind of said yes, last week. Yesterday, it's, you know, days are old. <laughs> the temple brought focus to the people. That's, they needed the temple to bring their focus to the people. David didn't need that temple for that focus. And we can see that all through his life and through the Psalms. David had a focus on God. Now, of course, he, he used the, part, the, the tabernacle and he used the ark. But David had a focus on God long before he got involved with the tabernacle and the ark. Third question, did David check with Nathan each time he made these attacks that we're talking about? And did he use the ark? Did David check with Nathan the prophet? And did he use the ark? Anybody want to speculate? Because it doesn't tell us. 
doesn't tell us. Well, we know that in our chapters before that David was constantly asking God, should I attack? Should I uh, try to take Jerusalem? Should I do this? Should I do that? He constantly asked God. So my gut assumption is, yes, David checked in with God every time he attacked in the people that we're talking about here. And highly likely that he took the ark with him for these attacks. That he carried the ark. Because that was what they did all through the time of Joshua. They, they carried the ark as a reminder. This is God helping us. Now, again, we can ask God, does God condone that? We don't, we don't think this way anymore. We don't pray, God help us. Maybe we do. God help us win this football game, right? Because God's involved with the other team also. We say, God, help us do our best. Okay. So, David defeated the Moabites, and the Moabites became servants to David. So, David's war with Moab seems out of place. Because David's great-great-grandmother was a Moabite. Ruth was a Moabite. And there's another time that David entrusted his mother and father. He sent his mother and father to live in Moab while he was running away from Saul to keep them safe. So why does David attack Moab? We don't know. But they speculate there's a possibility maybe the Moabites mistreated or killed his parents because we don't ever hear anything more. So that, that's the possibility of why he would go attack them. But then it says he made them servants. Now, we know in the days of Joshua, Joshua was supposed to wipe these enemies all the way out. But David didn't do that. He attacked them and he made them, or he killed some of them, but he made the rest of them servants. Shouldn't he have wiped them out? Well, now this is the commentary speculating again. Generally, God wanted Israel to be so blessed and strong among that the other nations that um, were taxed by Israel because they paid a tribute. So they would recognize Israel's dominance. And, and I, I went further than the commentary and I said, so they would recognize Israel's dependence on a real God and not, a, not their fake gods that everybody else had. So by, by David coming and wiping these other places out and leaving servants, they would be able to recognize that God was a part of Israel and learn from them. So God, therefore, wouldn't want to destroy all the neighbors. God wanted to lead every nation to Christ. By destroying their armies and their government, it would allow the people of that nation to see a new way of living. All right? But if you have a government that's got their armies and they keep drafting their people and sending them off, then the people are going to be dependent on their government and their way of doing things. But basically what David did was wipe out the armies and wipe out the government and said, okay, now we are your government. You pay us to protect you. And so now the people would have a chance to see God working through Israel. Does that make sense? That's, this is my speculation, John, so don't hold me to it if I'm wrong. But, I'm, but I think that makes sense of why I mean, God, he didn't, obviously didn't wipe them out, but this would make sense of what God would have in mind is for the other nations to see God at work. So David also struck down King Habadazer 
David took from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. So these aren't, these aren't just little battles. He's talking about wiping out whole nations or whatever. And David hamstrung all the chariot horses, but left enough for 100 chariots. Now this sounds terrible. John, you had horses, right? What's it mean to hamstrung a horse? They can't do anything. They can't do anything. Now, I tried, to, I tried to research this to make myself feel better. If you, cut, if you cut the hamstring totally on the horses, it's the death sentence. They can't, they can't walk. But there was ways to, to hamstrung, what they called hamstrung, that would just make them so they couldn't run. They could still stand and walk. They couldn't run. So we'll trust that that's what David did. But... Uh, the border of Israel went to the Euphrates now. So the promise made by God would be fulfilled. Unto thy seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So because David took out this king Habadazer, now their boundary goes up to the Euphrates River. Hamstringing the horses would be a military necessity if he... If he didn't, I mean, he could take the horses, but then he's got to care for the horses and everything by, by hamstringing him, assuming they could still walk. The horses could survive, but they couldn't be used by another army to attack Israel again. And he kept a hundred of them, and that shows remarkable self-control for David. He's got these thousands of chariots, and he's only got a hundred horses, and he only keeps a hundred... Yeah, enough for 100 chariots. He's basically obeying the principle of Deuteronomy 17, 15 through 6. Some take pride in chariots and some in horses, but our pride is in the name of our God. In Psalm 33, 16, a king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might, it cannot save. Don't put your trust in your instruments. Keep your trust in God. We would be that well to keep this psalm in mind and realize that only Jesus can save us. So 5.8, David put garrisons among the Armenians of Damascus and Armenians became servant to David and brought tribute. And you can read the rest of the scripture. It talks about killing all these people. I just picked out part of it. And again, the tribute was a tax levied on conquered nations that helped support Israel's government and demonstrated that the conquered nation was under Israel's control. It also would set a new focal point for the people of that nation rather than their focus being on their own government, now they've got to focus on Israel because they've got to pay them this tribute tax to keep from wiping them out, whatever. So King Toy of Hamath heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadaz Hazabaz, or whatever that says. Toy sent his John Joram to King David to greet him and congratulate him. So neighboring nations saw the hand of God on David and brought him honor and gifts. They knew that a strong godly leader of Israel was good for the whole community of nations, not just for the good for Israel itself. Not every nation around Israel was hostile to their God and David didn't treat them as they were hostile. We make a mistake if we treat every unbeliever as openly hostile to God. That's not ours to judge other people like that. So what are we to do? What are we to do to the unbelievers around us, the people that, that don't seem to understand God or whatever? What are we to do? Pardon? Live the best lives we can. Amen. You get a gold star, right? <laughs> Rebecca says pray for them. Yes. 
All, our call is to pray for them and help pray for them that they would find a new leader in their life. We are all led by something. Maybe we're led by ourselves. Maybe we're led by the devil. We want to be led by Christ. So we pray for others that they find a new leader. I think we also want to befriend them because hopefully the Jesus and us will rub off on them. So I agree with them. But we want to pray for them, but we don't shun them. Okay, Dwayne, for those that you at home, Dwayne said, pray for them, but also befriend them, help them to see Christ in us. Help them to see that, that we're not... We're not ogres. We're not out to kill everybody. We are here to share the love of Christ. And if we are hostile to others because we think, that guy's a horrible sinner. He's a drunk all the time. He's just no good. That's just not going to help a person at all. If we can befriend them and help them through where they're at and help them to see there's a better life, maybe their life will change. Yes. Yes. So what Rebecca is saying there is that the Bible says that we need to help and reach out to others to help them see a new life, to see we're trying to help them see what heaven is like and make that choice for heaven. We want others to make they gotta make the choice. But if they see us as being mean to them and hostile to their lifestyle and everything like that, that's not gonna help them come to Christ. If we befriend them and try to help them see a new life, maybe they'll make that life decision. And that's tough. That may take years. It may take a lifetime of interaction with another and help them see a different way. So we got to have patience of Job, right? We got to have Christ in our hearts in order to be able to help others. So when David returned, let's see, when King of Toy and Hamath heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadzari, Toy sent his son Joram to King David to congratulate him. Uh, oh, I forgot something. David kept receiving gold and acclamation from these other nations and ten, uh, uh, the tribute and all this stuff. He received all these gifts. What did David do? with those gifts? What did they do with all this gold and silver he collected? Did he save it up for the building of the temple? Correct. Sue says he saved it up for building the temple. In other words, he didn't make himself filthy rich. He dedicated everything he got back to God. And he knew he wanted to build the temple, right? But he couldn't. But he knew the temple would need a lot. So everything he collected went to building the temple. So, uh, David administered justice and equity to all his people. Oh, I went back one. And so David, God used David to lead Israel to victory in every direction he went. He didn't go west because that was the Mediterranean Sea, but every other direction he went. And De Israel possessed more land under David uh, close to what Abraham was promised than any other time in Israel's history. So David, when, when God gave the promised land to Abraham, that's pretty much what David got. The biggest part of that is what David got. So why did David pursue justice? Why did David pursue justice for his people and for the people around him? Well, because it was God's command. David knew what God wanted, and David looked up Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20 and said, Ooh, this is what God wants. This is what I'm going to do. You shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes and all your towns that the Lord your God has given you, and they shall render just decisions for the people. You must not distort justice. You must not show partiality. You must not accept bribes for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. 
justice and only justice you shall pursue so that you may live long and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So justice characterizes how we should treat other people. If you're fair to the way you treat other people, they may not be fair back to you, but God's call to you is to be fair to other people. Right? So Lawrence, when you're, when you're uh, loading seed on somebody's thing and they start to drive off and you say, wait a minute, you didn't get it all. You could say, oh, just go ahead, I'll just keep it for myself. Or you could say, ah, wait a minute. I want to be just and right. I want to make sure you get everything you paid for, right? That's what you say. That's true for all of us in everything we do. We want to treat other people right because that's what God calls us to and that's the character of God. We're made in God's image. We should have God's characters within us. Ken, I think key point too, verse 13, it says, and David became famous. What that means is the pagans you see that David was being blessed by God and David gave God all the glory. And to change that to the Pittsburgh church is what we are doing now is not for us, but for the glory of God. And it's God working through us to shine his name on what can happen. So I think, you know, we look at this, and it's not for our glory, but for God's glory, and God's working through us to make this happen. Right. Everything David did was for the glory of God. Everything we are doing should be. We're not just trying to make our own self comfortable so we can sit back and relax. Though I'm sure Bruce would love to sit back and relax, right? No, we're doing this for the glory of God. And, and we pray that God uses our meager efforts, which we're really not doing that much. But we pray that God would use everything we do to glorify himself and maybe help others see whatever. And so the neighbors would see that David was just and he treated people right and he became famous as the best king of Israel because of the way he treated other people. We want to be famous in Pittsburgh and in Dark County because of what we're trying to give glory to God for everything we do. And um, everything David did to ple everything David did pleased the people. They were all happy with David, right? But not because David tried to please them. He didn't try to please them. Who did David try to please? God, right? And then the, that just fell in line to help the people. But there might have been people that that weren't happy with what David did. But because they saw that the nation was becoming closer to God, that would make them happy. So not everybody's going to like everything we do. But if they see that what we're doing is for God's glory, they'll help us out. Because they want to glorify. Anybody that is a Christian is going to want to glorify God. That should be our life's goal, to make God happy. So this last uh, verse is, um, Joab, son of Zeruah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, and son of Alud, was recorder. Zadok, son of Athub, and Ahimelech, son of Abathar. I should have had Sue read all this stuff. Sarah was secretary. Benaiah was son of Jehoiada. And over the Cherites and the Pelites, and David's sons were priests. Part of David's success was, as a ruler was found in his ability to assemble, train, empower, and maintain a gifted, committed team. If we're going to be successful as Pittsburgh Church of the Brethren, we need everyone's gifts. We need, we need everyone's participation. If it, even if it's just a prayer or a letter or... You're a smile. We need everyone to participate in what we're trying to do. We don't find the list like this in Saul's government. In fact, we know that Saul spent most of his time chasing David and 
fighting with, within. There's a lot of infighting under Saul. Nothing is accomplished in God's kingdom without order. Behind the scenes, God is moving with utmost order and organization, though we don't see that. We do know the devil likes chaos, and God likes order. So another sidebar, at the end of that line it says, David's sons were priests. What's wrong with that statement? Anybody know what's wrong with that statement? Ron got it. They're not Levites. How can David's sons be priests? That just jumped out at me when I was reading them. What's going on here? Was David trying to do something through the back door to change the nation? What, what's going on? Well, the, the explanation, and I had to kind of research this a little bit, the explanation that makes the most sense is David's sons were considered priests in the order of Melchizedek. After the Israelites conquered Jerusalem, their own kings took over the title Melchizedek from the Jezubite kings who had formerly ruled there. Since those kings had also been priests, the Israelite kings assumed an honorary role as priests and interceded for the nation in prayer. And we can see a king wanting to intercede in the nation for prayer. Royal, oh, the NIV says royal advisors. Thank you, Bruce. So they were not allowed to do sacrifices. That was reserved for the descendants of Aaron, the Levites. Accordingly, David's son would have possessed the inherited title and performed some duties, but these duties would not have included any of the functions reserved for the Levitical priests so that there would be no violation of the king-priest boundary. But under that theory, it's interesting to think that Christ himself, therefore, became a priest in the order of Melchizedek and heir to the throne of David, not through the tribe, the Levite tribe, but because of royal succession. That's just an interesting sidebar. Okay, back to the thing. What are we to learn from this chapter? All these fightings and going on. What, can, what are we supposed to take home with us? Well, I, this was tough. And since I went canoeing, I didn't really get time to think about what David, what we're supposed to learn. But I do maintain that it wasn't just David winning these battles. It was God helping the Israelites win the battles. I, I don't know how. I wasn't there. I couldn't watch it. But we've talked about that before. If you go wipe out 20,000 uh, fighters, or, and especially if they got chariots and you don't, there's got to be something going on how you could win all these battles. Now, just another sidebar, and, and I know I'm all wet for saying this. The Russians don't seem to be doing too well against Ukraine. Why is that? There, because, I'm going to say, because there's a darkness over Russia. They're not, they're not together. They're not uh, working together. They're not, I don't think, I think Russia's more or less pagan. So there's kind of a darkness there in their thinking. And God may say, uh, like he does with Pharaoh, What's he saying with Pharaoh? I'm going to harden their heart. God may be kind of hardening their heart because it's so unjust what's going on. Not that Ukraine's any perfect place. I mean, they got their problems too, but they got, I think they got a little bit more light, as it were. In our lives... Communion with God will help us in our daily struggles, our hard times, our relationships, our battles. The closer we, we become to God and God's people, the more we do things together and put, give the glory to God for what we do, the more we're going to see God getting us through 
the battles of life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to commune with you and with each other and to see how you are working in our lives today. We need your light. In Jesus' name, amen.